Um, you may remember that when the iPhone first came out, it had a, a, a certain collection of software provided by Apple, and Steve Jobs made a big deal about how we don't want to let people put third-party software on this thing because it's going to wreck the experience of the phone. Uh, and now they've got 500 million apps. It's a major profit center for Apple, and there's a whole ecosystem that formed around that. Um, <clears throat> right now, there's a lot of ferment and innovation going on in the open source software world, but uh, people have a hard time, you know, finding the right software to install, and I think that's hindering the 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 emergence of a of a true global marketplace for open source software. So we've gotten involved in 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 building a, a global catalog, and I just want to kind of go over the history of how how that happened. <clears throat> this is a website for my company. We call ourselves a civic solutions company. We focus on, de on developing software solutions uh, for government agencies and nonprofit organizations, primarily government. And uh, our mission is to, to do that through open source software as much as possible. And we, we are a Drupal shop, so a lot of the solutions we build are based on Drupal. Uh, the, my company is, it was created by the same team that built the uh, website for the New York State Senate a few years ago, uh, driven by uh, the fact that you know, falling government budgets, rising government needs were creating a need for better government using fewer dollars, and also driven by things like this. Uh, the former uh, state majority leader of the New York State Senate was convicted on corruption charges, and uh, the new government wanted to make a show of transparency. And so, they, one way to do that was by bringing in a new team that would that would uh, replace technology that looked like this <laughs> with something more modern, and and also then and a website that looked like this, which was static HTML built with Dreamweaver, with something a little more modern. Uh, we came in with the slogan of efficiency, transparency, and participation, and built a website that you know has Twitter and Facebook. This is our built on Drupal. Uh, people can sign up. We created you know a search engine so people could search legislation, so they could watch uh, Senate. Uh, hearings and other meetings online as they were happening live, a lot more interactivity. Uh, and at the same time that we were doing this, other initiatives were happening that have built the movement for open source and Drupal in government. Uh, the, the Obama administration <coughs> issued this directive very early on in Obama's first term. Of course, they built their own website on Drupal, and that served as a signal to other government agencies that open source and Drupal were viable and scalable. And as a result, Drupal has become the government content management system of choice. It actually, you know, if you look at websites in general, WordPress is, has, you know, there are more websites built on WordPress than anything else. But in this specific space of government websites, <coughs> Drupal uh, has more market share than anyone else. Uh, and so open source is winning pretty big there, and Drupal in particular. There have also been movements to share code between local and national governments. Uh, the White House has its own uh, account and project pages on Drupal.org, uh, as do we at the Senate and you know projects on GitHub. And there are movements afoot to transform data warehouses into open data networks, you know, so that instead of data being locked up in silos, it's visible through APIs. And the web is just a very natural way to do that because of all the architecture of the web that provides this open architecture through which you can share things. Here's an example of something that's being done in New York. Um, in the past, you may remember, if you used to ride the bus in olden days, you know, they had these little printed schedules that you'd get, the government had to print them and reprint them, and people would lose them and get new ones, and uh, I'm sure they're still doing that, but 
<laughs> but on New York City buses, they've actually uh, put transmitters that transmit live the locations of the buses. They've got an open architecture so that uh, that information is, is, is retrievable via APIs, and people are building apps off of that so that people can find out when their bus is actually going to get there. Uh, in, uh, in Portland, they came up with this system called TriMet, developed this thing called a General Transit Feed Specification, which is an open API. Uh, Google got involved in it and started using it to collect information about bus schedules and bus routes with, you know, with GP or, uh, geolocation, geolocated information. Uh, and more and more cities have started using that. There are now hundreds of cities that are using that as a, there are projects like the 311 Appapalooza, you know, like another contest to build, uh, you know, software projects. And so what, what this has brought us to is an ecosystem in which there are hundreds of cities, thousands of applications, but no one knows who has built what. And, and it's a little bit, to me, like the old days before Google showed up and created a standardized search engine, back when people were using links on Yahoo to try and find stuff on the web. People can't find the apps that are already in existence. There's a lot of duplication. Uh, and, and so uh, efforts are underway to share code, but they haven't been very successful. This is a, the federal IT dashboard that was built by the White House. They open sourced their code, but no one's using it. Part of the reason is because they didn't build it in a very, very reusable way. But part of it is because, you know, people don't necessarily know where to find it. You can't just put something up on, on GitHub and expect the world to be a path to your door. So the question is, how do we foster reuse? Well, APIs and open standards clearly matter. Talent clearly matters. And we've concluded that a, a crowdsourced catalog of this information matters. The same way that, for example, Wikipedia became a crowdsourced encyclopedia of information about great stuff like, you know, all the minor characters in Star Trek. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, we, our idea initially was we would create a single catalog that would be a global catalog where everyone could find all the apps that people are, are using, specifically focused on apps for, for what we're calling civic software that provides uh, civic services. So here my business partner, Andrew, wrote a blog post when we were still at the New York State Senate saying, you know, we wish that a nonprofit would help government entities figure out how to share code. That uh, led to this organization, Civic Commons, uh, ultimately hiring us to build a website called the Civic Commons uh, marketplace uh, a couple of years ago, which was intended to serve as a catalog of all the software that people were using, and not just uh, proprietary software, by the way. Also, you know things like SharePoint and, and stuff. Our feeling was that you know we wanted a place where people could find out what's working where, where you know basically people who are buying the software meaning in, like government procurement people could, could ex trade notes and build a marketplace of information around this. And over the next couple of years, hundreds of applications in a number of cities were added to the, to the database, along with information about you know, where it's been deployed so that you can contact that, that user and find out. This was also intended to be a, a marketplace for vendors to find so that cities could find vendors who service Drupal or what, what have you, you know. Um, and there are all kinds of interesting apps in there, like Adopt a Hydrant, and, um, you know. Uh, that in turn led to something that kind of surprised me. I, I wasn't expecting it. We were asked to, to build a, a hackathon website. And we ended up reusing the same code, because when you think about it, hack a hackathon is kind of similar to an app catalog. Uh, you know, a map catalog is a place where s software is cataloged that people are using. A hackathon is a project to try and build new apps. And so, 
After we'd done that, they asked us to turn the work we'd done into a reusable distribution because it turned out, contrary to what we initially assumed, that people don't, that, that there are people who want more than one app catalog. So, for example, Code for Europe uh, is, is interested in building their own app catalog. And so we were asked, could we take these websites you've built and turn them into Drupal distros so people could spin up their own? Uh, one of the things we've tried to do in this is to follow uh, some data standards ourselves in the way uh, it's built. So we've, we've developed a system for following as closely as possible to the data schema in schema.org to add fields and field definitions to the distro that we're building. Uh, the goal is to make all of these app catalogs, if people want to have more than one, at least we want the information to be interoperable between them. We're, 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 the Civic Commons uh, website already has uh, uh, an API built using the services module. We're going to add that to the distro. And it's designed to federate with, with hackathon websites. So that the idea is someone, you, there, our, our initial thinking was we would actually create two distros. One would be a, a distro for, uh, for building apps catalogs. The other would be a distro for building hackathon websites. And they would talk to each other. So you'd have a, an applications catalog that stores applications, organizations that are using the applications, and instances where the applications have actually been deployed. And the hackathon websites are places where people, you know, mark down problems that, that are trying to solve with, with the hackathon. They create projects to solve those problems and teams to work on those projects. A project was something we, saw, we see as as a prototype or, an, or as an application under development. Once it reaches a level of maturity where other people would want to reuse it, it would get promoted up to the applications catalog. Our thinking on this has changed a little bit. Instead of two distros, what we're thinking is uh, one distro, possibly to be named the World Apps distro for Drupal, and it would include uh, features that you can turn on or off to enable an apps catalog would have that same information, applications, organizations, deployments, and an API, some standard community features for you know, events and locations and blogging. You can turn on the hackathon functionality. And, and, and then there's some other things that it, it seems are important. One is open data. A lot of government agencies in particular really want to be able to share not just their software, but but their data. And so uh, we've been working, there, I, I don't know how many people here have heard of CCAN. It's a Python-based open data platform. We're, we're basically creating a Drupalized version of that called DCAN. <laughs> uh, and we're going to wipe out those Python folks. <laughs> and, and another thing that's come up is apps contests, which are a little like hackathons, but a little different. You know, and and so we think that that's going to require its own separate functionality. And then finally, the idea that I find kind of most intriguing to get to is civic sandboxes. And the idea here is that, okay, you go to the catalog, you find out, you're browsing through these you know, different options, trying to figure out which software you need. Well, then you want to try it out. And the idea is when, when you decide you want to try it out, you get to click on a button and it will take you to a, a, your own little sandbox demo version of the software so you can actually uh, see how it works. So, so that's, that's the concept. And uh, we have a distro that we've published on Drupal.org with, with the apps catalog functionality already built out, a uh, couple of bugs in it. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's getting there. And we're working with Code for Europe, uh, one, one of the guys who's uh, gotten act active in helping us do that is, is Paul Mackay, who's, hi Paul, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you, you can introduce yourself and uh, just say a couple of words about what. Um, yeah, sure. 
Um, so, yeah, so I'm working for Nesta, and Nesta is the main kind of uh, organization in the UK that's uh, focused on promoting innovation in the UK. Nesta is a partner, along with another number of other similar kind of European organizations, and uh, running the Code for Europe program this year. It's the first year this has been running, but it's basically following the Code for America model, which has been going a couple of years now. The idea is taking fellows, putting them into cities, and giving them to kind of build apps and help people, you know, people in uh, city councils kind of develop more of that kind of uh, you know, feel of, uh, you know, rapid development, you know, development of apps and like that. Um, so part of what I've been working on is working with Sheldon on developing the distro, launching uh, Civic Commons for Europe, uh, into which kind of the output of this program will kind of go into, as well as other kinds of apps. Uh, another program that Nest is also involved in is called Apps for Europe, which is kind of about trying to solve the problem of, of, of the uh, disconnect between hackathons and, uh, and, and, and things like these projects and, and, and people building the app. So quite often these hackathons, um, you know, develop a bunch of stuff and then people just kind of go away and, and, and they kind of get lost. So part of the goal of the distro is to kind of be able to link up the idea that if you have problem statements and then projects that develop some interesting apps, then that, um, that could then get kind of migrated into an application on the catalog just with a sort of, you know, simple operation. And the Apps for Europe project is, is going to then it would hopefully use that in terms of um, software for hackathons and um, and it's providing things like business and mentoring support for people who are developing stuff in the hackathons so hopefully they can then make those, you know, like, take those with things like that. So that's the basic concept. I, I want to leave a little time for, for questions but just the one other thing that is interesting to me is again how many apps catalogs does the world need? I was originally thinking, well, you really only need only need one Wikipedia. But I, I also know having that Wikipedia has spawned a whole bunch of other wikis that are, you know, because after they built it, other people wanted to use their software for all kinds of crazy purposes. And we're we're finding more and more people. At, this is at the stage we're at. Who, for example, the city of New York has hundreds of apps that. You know, have been custom built for the city, and and they're currently working to build their own apps catalog just for the city of New York. Uh, there's there's a project under underway, or an effort underway to build something for Africa, and uh, so or there, there's someone else we've talked to who wants to build a catalog specifically for activists who are mostly like government reformer types who probably. Don't want to share, have this, they don't have the same exact software needs as government agencies that are trying to figure out how to how to, how to plan transportation schedules or that kind of thing. Uh, I was sorry. just talking with um, Gary Osani from Oxfam, uh -huh. and he's actually um, he's trying to pull together people to do something very similar for for NGOs. Mm -hmm. So you should read, uh, I send you just an email. Yeah, you should oh, really talk great. With yeah, yeah. We, we we'd love. The opportunity to collaborate with anyone on this, it, it, feature requests. You know, if people want to, you know, to help us actually develop the code, that's one of the <laughs> things we always use. Just go to Drupal.org and there's an issue queue and such like that, or like, how would someone who wants to get involved get involved? You can post things to the issue queue. That's probably the easiest easiest way to do it. Uh, we have a GitHub. Repo too, but the Drupal queue is probably the most natural way. Or you can uh, contact me. Uh, you know, my contact. In, I'm 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 the project maintainer, so okay. if, so you can find me through the Drupal page as well. So, are there any questions or comments or tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> How do you decide what's going to go into your catalogue? Because it's obviously a huge amount of amazing apps, and some might be more, more open than others. I don't know, I know there's different open source licenses and different degrees of openness, isn't it? Yeah. So how do you, just, how do you choose what's, what's going to be in your catalogue? Well, we're not building a single catalogue at this point. We're building the software so people, whoever builds a website to build their own catalogue will be able to make that choice. The, the Civic Commons uh, website, which is what we built initially, thinking it would be a one-off website, saw what they were doing is basically like building a wiki. So basically anyone could go there and add an app. 
And that's worked pretty well. Um, they've gotten some spam, but it hasn't been people adding apps. It's more uh, your usual run-of-the-mill spammers adding comments with invitations to buy a Viagra or whatever. Yeah. Um, and but uh, and and so it, I I suppose there's a potential problem if you're too open, like with any open project that that people will add stuff that really doesn't belong there. Uh, there's a, a five star rating feature so that people can, you know, indicate how well they like the apps. And they're also the people aren't simply adding applications, they're also adding deployments. So if someone adds an app and no one's actually deploying it, that information would would be part of the information they'd have to decide which apps are really worth checking out. So, uh, I've got a question that, I mean, are just, as I said, we're trying to, to determine what features are, uh, are most important to include in a catalog, like the, and the, what kind of information. Uh, and if, if people have any suggestions, is, is this a, a problem that you've thought about? Or I guess not. I, th I think, I think the, one, one, one of the things that I see <laughs> happening with, with kind of like app sprints mm -hmm. or like ha uh, hackathons mm -hmm. is that, well, on one hand, it's kind of like governments, like, okay, now we're going to get these free coders coming in. And then, I, I, sometimes that works, and mm -hmm. people get enthusiastic about it. But a lot of times, I've I've heard that um, there were like two hackathons in Belgium, mm -hmm. and one was really successful, mm -hmm. and then they had like three or four apps for the Ganse Feesten, <coughs> you know, which is like a big festival mm -hmm. uh, in the city, and then a lot of apps were written for that, which was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And in another city, it didn't really work that well. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got the feeling, like. Could, would you make it so that it, the, the people that actually built the app on the hackathon become discoverable so that they get contacted to be work you know to do further work on it or or ha I think that's that's probably going to be an important feature to make hackathons not just you know governments <coughs> asking for free work um, so I think that's going to be important I think also the like syncing and and syndication of, of what's going on that's yeah. going to be important. Yeah, the syndication is the problem that I it keeps me awake nights because I, I don't quite know how to do that. <laughs> but yeah, we we definitely, I mean, there was a reason why the Civic Commons called the original website the uh, a marketplace. They, they intended yeah. it to be something that would create a bit, you know, a business opportunities for people who are supporting uh, and deploying software. And I, th I think there is a sort of disconnect with hackathons in particular, that people go to hackathons, there's a, a day or two of incredible energy and then everyone goes home and a lot of projects yeah. die on the vine and it's because, you know, people have energy to volunteer for a day or two and, and learn something, but people aren't going to spend the, the amount of time needed to build a full-fledged app just as volunteers and there needs to be a transmission belt from from all those ideas that come out of hackathons to funding to finance transforming the, what are basically uh, proof of concepts into full-fledged apps and that's that's why you know the, the 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 vision of this is to have have something that can both both uh, host enable people to quickly spin up hackathon sites and a lot of hackathons are going on we're talking to an organization in the United States that organizes hundreds of hackathons every year. Uh, but then how do you take all that energy and turn it into real productive software that people can use? And, and, uh, but that's, that's why both the application catalog and the hackathon have some kind of organization in them. So if, if you're part of the team that works on a project, then your team gets added to to, to that project and, the, and presumably the best uh, projects from a hackathon will get noticed enough that someone can then contact the team and say, 
we want you to develop this into a full app. And then the organizations that are listed on the apps catalog include not just like city governments that are deploying the app, but vendors who are uh, in installing or have created the app or providing services. Um, as far as the Federation question is concerned, though, um, I'm, I'm, I, I just don't know what to do with that. I, I mean, because is, should it be two-way syncing? Should it be, you know, should, should there be like one app catalog that, is, that rules them all and everything treats it as the mothership, um, I server client kind of model? I, think, I, I don't think two-way syncing is going to work. Probably not. Because, because you... Um, because what you were just saying, like uh, as as a, a catalog installation, I probably want to decide what's going to come on it. Like uh, for example, um, some time ago, I tried to get uh, a project onto a database that the European Union has uh, for um, code, like open source projects that could be useful for the European uh, for for um, instances that I think it was a Commission, um, and we couldn't get our code in. Because this, because we we were not contracted or we were not from the European Commission, right. so so I think often you're going to get this kind of um, thresholds where they say like you can only get your code in if you are actually one of us. So mm -hmm. so in, and for that reason, I don't think a two-way sync is actually necessary. Maybe you want to have some sort of discoverability, but probably even that is not really necessary. Yeah. So I think aggregation is is probably enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking something like the feeds module. Yeah, and would, it should be really that would simple. pull in. Yeah. You know, w w one of the things were f that were there are different use cases around the idea of sharing app information between websites. One is that you know, if, for example, if you're building a hackathon website for sanitation, you probably don't want the transportation apps in there, and and so we're trying to find a model where if you're building if yeah. you're creating a hackathon, you can include some information about yeah. available apps that are relevant, but not all the ones that are not relevant. Also, think about translation, uh, localization. Yeah, and that's that's where you're going to have a problem. Yeah, translation is yes. internationalization is another yes. another challenge. Um, yeah, and duplication. Did you have a question? Question, but I quite like the Ruby toolbox sort of approach to it, where you can, as well as the, the browsing by categories and everything, you can see at a glance how active and how well maintained a project is. So mm -hmm. it's it's quite easy to stop, um, spot a band where and all the things that aren't compatible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone uses Ruby toolbox, but that's kind of the, the ideal model for me in terms of the catalog. You think it's better for that purpose than say the say Drupal project pages where you can no, also... No, I just thought if it was non-Drupal software as well, if it was right. encompassing different types of software, then that mm -hmm. sort of easy glance. Mm -hmm. I haven't used the, Drup the Ruby toolbox. Is that that's for Ruby on Rails? Yeah, it's for Ruby Gems. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, I know nothing about, about <laughs> Rails. So. Well, any other questions, comments? Uh, if not, maybe we should... Should adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.